Hey y'all, we're Mandolin Orange. Welcome to Blue's Kitchen. Mandolin Orange are an American folk duo from North Carolina. Andrew and Emily took some time out before their sold out London show to talk to us about their recent album, Tides of a Teardrop, a stunningly beautiful record that touches on country, bluegrass and folk. The guys also perform a spellbinding version of the traditional folk ballad, Silver Dagger. And while you're watching, like this video and subscribe to the channel for regular episodes of The Blues Kitchen Presents. Mandolin Orange, Andrew and Emily, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So you've got a sold out London show tonight, sold out in Paris on the back end of a what, three week tour, something like that? Yeah. About, yeah. Yeah. And I was looking at your website this morning, you're pretty much then all the way through to like two sold out shows at the Ryman as well in Nashville. So it's quite an exciting time for you guys at the moment. Kind of wild, man. It's, it's nice to, to get to travel around Europe, especially, and, and yeah. have folks to play for, you know, because we've definitely done tours where we haven't had people to play for. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you and That's now a good feeling. Yeah. Six albums in. So yeah. you've certainly put in the groundwork and deserve every single moment of it. Well, thank you. Um, the new album as well, Tides of a Teardrop, is beautiful. Thank you. Um, so congratulations on that. I know you guys are multi-instrumentalists, so when you're recording, is it pretty much just the two of you working on the records? It has depended on the record, but this most recent one, we did um, pretty much most of it with the band that we toured with. Mm -hmm. um, so drummer, bass player, and then um, guitar, Josh Oliver plays sort of everything, guitar, keys, stuff like that. So we work on them a lot, uh, the two of us, um, but this was the first one that we really tried to sit down with the group and arrange before we got to the studio yeah. um, and and put a little more thought into it ahead of time. Usually we just let it happen when we're in there. Well, the arrangement's really beautiful as well. And you guys did um, the opening track, Golden Embers, mm -hmm. which has a little bit more kind of orchestration to it than maybe I've heard on your other bits and pieces as well. I assume because you spent so much more time in kind of pre-production, that was something that was delicately thought out. Yeah, that was one that came about you know very just kind of over time i think i was showing the the group that tune and clint the bass player um came up with that bass line that uh that kind of like the one that we ended up building the whole orchestral part off of i think we were in san francisco down in the green room and he was he was coming up with that bass line it was like dude it's awesome we got to remember that so I did a little voice memo and tried to <laughs> capture that yeah. and uh so then when we got to the studio we had that idea already so we just uh Played it all live in the studio, but then went back and added the parts to it so, to really you know, flesh that one part out. Across the album as a whole, there's a real kind of lovely, delicate feel to it. And there is a sense of melancholy, but also beautifully uplifting at the, at the same time. I was wondering maybe to get a little bit personal and dig into the tunes, kind of what mindset you guys are in when you're actually writing the album. This one, uh, I'd say more so than some of the other records, definitely had a a common thread throughout, which is uh, I lost my mom when I was 18. Okay. And so really decided that I wanted to talk about it and, and write about it and get some of those, you know, especially aggression, like a lot of the anger out and, and just be done with it and move on to a much lighter way of thinking and, and living. I think that does lend to some of the, like you were saying, the lightness of it as well, because a lot of that, a lot of those feelings of grief and anger have been present in all of our albums that, you know, we have a lot of sad tunes. Um, but I think because this album was trying to take it a little more head on, um, it allows for more of a release of that emotion instead of holding on. Mm -hmm. So that's perhaps what a kind of element of relief, if, if you will, that kind of comes alongside at this time. Yeah, I think so. And I, you know, I think with the way that we played the record too, we were having so much fun playing it all live, which is how we like to track, that I think that energy also comes across. You know, that uh, if we had just tracked out each individual part, um, we may have made it a little too sad. But because there's also <laughs> the excitement of playing live, I, I think that counterbalances some of the heaviness of the actual songs. Our viewers in a short while are gonna see the beautiful performance you did of Silver Dagger, um, an old, what we think is Brit British um, traditional song. It's really interesting because we find ourselves talking quite a lot on the Blues Kitchen about traditional American music and the kind of things that were popularised by Lead Belly, for example, at the beginning of the 1900s, 1920s, 1930s. It's not very often 
that we come across someone that's actually playing traditional British folk music. <laughs> so I was wondering how you got into it, how you discovered it, and maybe the influence it's had on your, your writing. Yeah, um, well, I mean, Emily and I are really influenced by a lot of old time tunes and and coincidentally, I think a lot of those songs did come from over here, you know, they've just been rearranged over the years and are what they are now. I think Silver Dagger, you got that one from Dolly Parton, I, right? Yeah, I heard on a Dolly Parton record, oh, really? but then like Doug Back and Joan Baez also did it decades ago and yep. a ton of people have covered it. And that's the fun thing about these tunes is every version is a little bit different and um, you can kind of take what you like and change what you don't like and all of it's valid. Do you guys know about Cecil Sharp House over in North London, in Camden? No. It's the Folk Song and Dance Society. It sounds a bit weird in old English, but mm. it's got the library of all the old traditional folk music. Cool. And as far as I understand, it's where Fairport Convention went to get all the lyrics, basically, for what became Liege and Leaf. Huh. Well, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that record. Yeah, cool. And I don't think they could read the music because it obviously it's, it was published music at the time, but not recorded music. But most of those kind of traditional tunes they found in the library at Cecil Sharp House, took the lyrics and then rearranged them for their own songs. Cool. And the way I've understood it is that obviously the way that the meter of the um, lyrics read like poetry is how they then constructed the songs around it. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. that's great. That's cool. There's so many like old time oh, yeah. tunes that we hear. Well, there will be multiple songs that kind of almost have the same melody or different lines uh, or you'll, the same lines in various songs. And I think there was because a lot of it was like maybe just written down or maybe just done by the music by ear. A lot of it seems to get mixed together and, um, and interpreted in different ways, like you said. What about its influence on your writing as well? Uh, it definitely changed how I think about lines and, and how much weight one line can have. I think because of what Emily's saying, how um, you do have this just huge genre of music that, that does kind of borrow lines from different songs. And a lot of times you see those same lines pop up. Mm -hmm. I think it makes me think a little bit about how weighty um, each line can be, you know, and, and concise at the same time and convey an entire point with just a few words. And so that's something that I really try to, to do when, when I'm writing is to, in the editing process, just eliminate as many words as possible and leave the ones that actually matter. And I think I've heard you say too that, like because we play so many of these old tunes that tons of people cover, makes you think when you're writing, even though a lot of times it's really personal, you want to write a song that it feels like someone else could play. Yeah. Sure. That you're not the only person that can could convey the song. Very generous with your writing <laughs> and your attitude towards it. Well, it, it, is, it makes it feel more songy to me, like you know, like more like an actual song. If yeah. uh, if you're able to just pick up an acoustic guitar or mandolin, ukulele, drum, whatever, and just play it, you know, and just play the song all the way through, and not have to have all these bells and whistles to to get the point across. It's funny, isn't it? Many people, you know, their, their dream is to have people singing their songs back to them in the venues that they play. And you've almost kind of taken it to the next level. It's like, what are we writing for people to kind of cover and reinterpret our, our tunes? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> On that note, I think it's probably time for some music, if that's all right. Sounds good. If you'd be kind enough to introduce your performance. We're Mandolin Orange. Uh, and this is our version of Silver Dagger.
I'll tell you again Loving lies And then they go And court some other Leave you alone To mourn inside My father was a handsome devil He had a chain five miles long On every leaf A heart does Of another day He's loved and loved Hopes that she might be your bride, for I've been warned and I've decided I'll sleep alone all of my Subscribe to The Blues Kitchen for live performances and interviews with the hottest blues, soul, country and roots musicians in the world today.